This is what a four degree world would look like. Um, the yellow and brown bits are areas that become virtually uninhabitable. The brown is uh, virtually well, desert essentially. Uh, the yellow is uh, much dried out um, <clears throat> and you can see from this that China, India, uh, much of South America, Africa, areas where th three, four billion people live will become virtually uninhabitable if this particular model is correct. Uh, this this means massive translocations of people, uh, migrations of tens or hundreds of millions of people from their uh, homes by the end uh, of this century. We're by no means prepared even to discuss this kind of possibility in polite company. Uh, certainly it's not something that uh, the <coughs> Harper government in Ottawa would even allow to be uh, brought forward for a point of discussion. But I bring it to your attention because it is serious science and just a year ago Australia looked pretty much like this. The southern part of the country, which had never reached 40 degrees Celsius before, was seeing temperatures of 47, 48 degrees, uh, for example, in the Melbourne region. Uh, eight of the ten hottest days in the instrumental record occurred in the same ten day period in uh, Tasmania, the little island state at the very southern end of Australia. So every now and then we see a portent of the future uh, occurring locally uh, and uh, the problem is that if we see a four degree world, the kind of situation that happened in Australia a year ago will become more or less normal if the science is correct. And believe it or not, despite the enormous efforts and hundreds of millions of dollars spent by uh, big coal and big oil to deny the uh, correctness of the basic science. There's no reason, in fact, to um, doubt that the basic science, particularly the greenhouse effect, which has been understood, understood clearly since the middle part of the 19th century, there's no reason to hold it in doubt. Incidentally, in just the last 50 years, the area that we call the tropics has expanded by about 275 kilometers on each margin toward the poles. So as the earth warms up, we're seeing in the migration of species, in the uh, shift of climate belts, the effects today. It's not a question, is global warming occurring? It is occurring, full stop, period. You can dispute a little bit perhaps how much human effect there is in that observation, uh, but I think the only uh, what we call forcing mechanism sufficiently strong to explain the climate change observations to date is the increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere since the beginning of the industrial age. There are lots of other factors but none of them have changed nearly so much as that single factor for which humans are responsible. So just think about that if you're harboring a climate change doubts and try to reconcile it with your doubts. Now, I started out in my introductory remarks by asking this question. In the face of the evidence and our non-response to it, how can we claim to be intelligent? We have this unique capacity for logical reasoning, for forward planning, for compassion toward other species and other human beings, and yet uh, we don't seem to exercise that very much. No corporate entity, no national government, no major international organization has begun to take seriously or at least to act in a way that reflects the seriousness of the scientific data that suggests human beings are changing the nature of the ecosphere in ways that may not be amenable to the future of human civilization. That's simply the facts of the matter as I see them. And the question then arises, why is this? If we're all of those things, if we have these unique qualities as humans and yet fail to respond to evidence that our own action is putting us at risk, what's going on here? And so perhaps naturally enough as a biologist I fall back on my biological roots. And I remember reading and having a light go on in my head when Theodosius Dobzhansky, this goes way back to the 70s actually, wrote in a paper and later a whole <laughs> I guess it was a phrase in a paper and then he put a whole paper out basically on this topic that nothing in biology makes sense unless you can interpret it through the uh, lens of evolution. Now if we can go on, I argued that human beings are products of evolution. The human brain is a product of human evolution. 
uh, human social behavior. We are social animals. We're not individual uh, animals, solitary organisms. We're social organisms. That's a fact that comes to us from the evolved nature of our neurosystems. We are not solitary. We're social organisms. Most of our instinctive behaviors derive from the brain. So given that we're um, uh, as much a product of evolution as a slime mold, there's no reason to think that uh, everything in human affairs, nothing in human affairs rather, makes sense, except in the light of evolution. Now I'm not for a moment saying that that's the only quadrant in which we can extract valuable information to explain human affairs, but it's something that we don't think of. So what I want to do is to at least open the possibility that in what we are observing here, here, this disconnect between what we claim to be and the way we act may in fact reside in something that we aren't conscious of uh, precisely because we tend not to want to think of ourselves as just another species. It's an insult to people to think that they are merely an animal, for example. So what I'm going to argue for the next few minutes is that whether you like it or not, folks, we are the product of evolution, and our evolution is controlled, as the evolution of other species is, by our genetic makeup, but also, and more so than in any other species, by something we call our mimetic makeup. Genes are nuggets of biological information or genetic information that can be passed from one generation to the next. A meme is a nugget of cultural information that can be passed from one generation to the next, but also within the generation. Memes accumulate over time. Cultural information accumulates. Technology improves. The libraries get fuller. We acquire more and more knowledge. And we act out of that knowledge as much as we act out of our genes. So human evolution is a codependent product of the interaction of genetic information and the mimetic information that is a reflection of our culture. Now the second premise here is that, you know, we think of ourselves at the pinnacle of evolution, but we're just, you know, part way there. We are continuing to evolve as are all other species. We're incomplete. We're not perfect. We aren't completely intelligent. We're not completely instinctive. We're in transition between a species controlled almost automatically by the impulses that are innately uh, acquired and that, uh, um, say, a, a very primitive organism, a lizard or a snake, might primarily act out of instinct. We may primarily, or at least we think we primarily, act out of higher intelligence. So there's a whole gradient here, and we're somewhere in the middle. 